squat scorn this video is sponsored by squarespace the antoine dupont of website builders it's been quite the week you know it's just good they turned up it's normally a platitude reserved for unengaged pundits discussing namibia or portugal in a world cup yet on saturday wales found themselves in exactly that situation. Threats of strike action finally sorting a segment of a situation their shambolic union had let run for years too long. And so, once the game was eventually called on, a team distracted now headed into a match with seemingly only two outcomes available. Either this was to be a torrid affair where England ran rampant against a Welsh side who hadn't slept in weeks, or it was to be the kind of historic, all-time, unlikely, back slammed against the wall Welsh win the S4C would would make two documentaries a month about for the rest of time, for at least another 70 years, at least the strike action game passed into folklore before the words could even be written, before ball could even be kicked. And then, much like the deal brokered between the union and its players, the game just landed somewhere in the middle. On Saturday, a much improved Wales, and yes, they were much improved, did you watch the Ireland or Scotland games, was shoved aside by a slightly more much improved England, who held out to record their first win in Cardiff since 2017 and set the Steve Borthwick regime onto an upwards curve. So how did England see it out, and how were Wales, once you just look at the actual rugby of it all? Looking at the actual rugby of it all closely from this match feels like a kind of raw shark test. England and Wales both getting better yet still some way off. Anyone who wants to see something can probably find evidence of it in this match. You can find proof that England are both on the brink of something special and nothing other than the next scalp Japan are lining up merely beating a team who are dog shit. And Wales gave plenty of reason for continued pessimism. Oh boy did they give us plenty of reason for continued pessimism. Though I am going to park most of it because I think it's been covered pretty well elsewhere by literally everyone but for those of us with PhDs in Warren Ball signs are also there that they're actually getting closer than the results would suggest to a return the tense joy of the low scoring Warren days of yore. Borthwick era England are becoming a pretty beautiful fusion of lesser tigers and harlequins. Saracen Steel tying together the Premiership's two most recent champions into an almost exact 50-50 or at least like 48-48 for 48 4% Saracens melting pot and whilst the Leicester DNA is Evan to cross their entire game, we got a great glimpse at the impact the batshit quarter shirt boys are having in the opening try, finished by Anthony Watson who's Lesser Tigers, it's, it's all, all over the place. The idea on this move is simple. Wales tend to leave a reasonable gap either side the fly half in defence, because they rely really heavily, heavier than most teams, on the scrum half and the flanker tracking across, allowing the ten to drift in either direction to just aid the tackle rather than being left on their own. So England want to stretch the hole between Williams and Hawkins to be bigger and emptier than the one in an average WU board member's skull. Part one occurs at the scrum itself. The front rows drop pretty early, so momentum ceases there's no kind of forward momentum here and the referee calls the ball to get out at which point the England pack sneakily wheel it all sideways slightly this might seem tiny but it means Jack Willis here is in the perfect position he breaks off and just gets into this channel before Tipperick the Welsh flanker blocking him from getting involved at all he can't get anywhere Willis is in his way Van Poorfleet picks up and just eyes up the first Williams Thomas here knowing if he can fix him the scrum half England can focus on his namesake the fly half alone Williams the first Williams commits England have taken out Wales as now two fail-safe players, two of their most important defensive decision makers and players in general, with one twist of the scrum, and the backs can now do their thing to get the other backs out of the way. Henry Slade is no stranger to believing every piece of unsubstantiated bollocks that he reads, and he manages to put that experience of falling for utter bullshit to fantastic use here. This is a superb line, coming from the outside, so there's enough deception to say he's hidden himself, but he also makes it incredibly obvious. There's no way that Owen Williams is missing him, he's not that level of subtle, his hands go up in the air as Van Poorfleet passes, and he's shouting the whole way he wants to be obvious, whilst also remaining subtle. Slade both runs his line and walks the line beautifully, he's so believable, and without tips and the nine to take care, Williams, oh in the fly off one, has to jam out to take care of him himself, at which point Farrell comes steaming round the corner with Malins on the inside of him. Farrell arcs slightly out towards Hawkins, just trying to pull him out, make sure he can't drift inwards at all, it looks like he's straightening, but actually he's drifting outwards, and 
Hawkins is acutely aware of Lawrence steaming down his channel here. All of this meaning Hawkins can't jam in to make up the ground. It's only as Farrell begins to give the pass that Hawkins realises the scale of the problem, but it's too late. Mayland is straight through. It's a lovely move. However, Joe Hawkins does make one important intervention. A split second after beginning to drift off, he realises he won't get to Maylins, and so he doesn't try. He just recommits to Farrell all over again and knocks him to ground. If Joe Hawkins doesn't bowl Farrell over, once Maylin breaks through, Farrell is here, Lawrence is here, and this is a 99% certain try under the post. There's no stopping this with the cover. Yes, England go on to score a moment later, but they score in the corner and Farrell misses the conversion, meaning Hawkins here saves Wales two points by just getting Farrell out of the game. Maylins and then later Lawrence steam into the 22, and after making the tackle, Mason Grady here, who was superb on debut, gets back up to his feet and contests the breakdown. And he does a pretty good job of it. He's never turning it over, but he's got a real chance of slowing this ball. Except, right as Jack Van Porfleet is about to enter the ruck and clear him out, Jack Willis, the best flanker in rugby ever, shoves him in the back gets him out of the way. Leave this to the professional, son. Willis blows Grady off the ball instantly. No contest here whatsoever, and Van Porfleet is in position for the next phase. He picks up the ball, forcing Tipperick once again to watch him. Tips can't drift until the pass has already come, and when it does, it's a rapid, exceptional ball. If Willis doesn't get Van Porfleet out of the way, this ball is likely available a second and a half longer because it's a scrum half clearing out. The service takes a second longer because it's a forward coming in. The pass is a second slower because it's a forward throwing it, and it probably allows not just Tipperick to drift, but Falatau, Adams, and likely others to fill in on this blind side to fill out the space so more Welsh space is covered. With none of those factors in play, thanks to Jack Willis, instead, the moment Van Porfleet holds Tiffrick, Farrell gives a wonderfully simple ball. Just get on the outside of Zamet, trying to commit anyone who would buy defenders' time so they can get it to the space. Freddie Stewart here means half penny can't go straight for Watson. He has to hold a little, has to watch him because Don Brandt could give it to either of them. And then the number eight times the ball really well to get Watson the ball before England run out of space or before half penny can drift. And from there, it's a superb finish by a guy who eats tries like this for breakfast and then wonders why they're not giving him the nutritional value he needs. It's because they're ethereal concepts, Anthony. They only represent a means of tracking wider context within the full game. You can't eat a voting system either. And yet that never stopped him. Every single morning, Anthony Watson wakes up and tries to eat a means of scoring points. But only last week did it occur to him, other people might want to do this as well. I don't know why he had this thought process, but he did. This is real. It's happened with Anthony Watson. So this is what he did, right? He headed to Squarespace. As he poured milk over a drop goal in order to eat it like Weetabix, he thumbed through a huge range of website templates. They've got such a huge range on Squarespace. The entire site is to be established and managed simply based on your choice here that Anthony Watson is making. It's so easy to build an entire site selling conversion sandwiches. The storefront features easy to integrate and detailed stats on how all of your crumpet shaped like penalties from the halfway line are performing. So many detailed stats to chew over. Oh no, I shouldn't give Anthony any ideas. Instead, I should just say if you're interested in vlogging three-point flavoured croissants on the internet, head to the link in the description and use the offer code SQUIDRUGBY to save yourself some money on making a simple-to-make, beautiful, beautiful website, even if it is about a hard-to-execute concept. Anyway, I said I'd stick to the rugby. Sometimes you've just got to do political material. But whilst Quinn's influence was still a work in progress, this felt like a week where Borthwick and Sinfield's Tiger Vision took full effect. I've been developing a theory that a team's defence is very much a reflection of their defence coach's personality and the Kevin Sinfield approach slots into that almost perfectly. Less aggressive than many of its contemporaries, England's watertight system instead prides itself on communication, togetherness and work rate. It's a struggle to find any single moment in any of their three games so far where an England defender is on their own. The connection is exceptional. Every defender tight to the player inside and outside him. Even the 13 channel, normally the source of the most Base either side the play on the rugby pitch tends to be heavily marked. Look how tight everyone is inside here, wrapping Wales up as they attempt to go wide. It's only the winger who has any space around them. This did allow Wales to get outside England a few times, but the catch-up defence is so good, so hard-working, it was rarely worth more than maybe 10 metres before someone caught up with them. It's pretty rugby league. An incredibly tight line wanting two players going into as many tackles as possible, and only a handful of players seemingly having a jackal licence. The Kevin Sinfield defence wants as many bodies on their feet as possible so there's no gaps, so they've got no space to work with, and if you've got props and hookers and the like contesting rucks, that isn't going to be possible. You can 
slow the ball down with a double tackle and it's more likely to allow you to have 15 people on their feet the following phase than contesting the ruck would. This is a shining example near the end of the game. There's nobody absolutely pelting up, but these three come up as a tightly connected group, catching where was a few meters behind the game line. The defense then resets and just gently jogs up. Where many might want to put pressure on Bigger here, England wait for him to make a decision, then put two bodies onto Raffle. It seems like he does well, but because England have calmly eaten up so much ground as a unit, Raffle actually only makes it up to the game line itself. Next phase, Hawkins is wanting to use Tipperick as an inside runner, but the flanker does a big fart that knocks him off balance, and even though the ball is uncontested for about two seconds, no England player goes for it. They just stay on their feet waiting for the next challenge. Wales continue gaining and losing the same few metres over and over again, until eventually a double tackle allows Farrell to hold Saracen's teammate Tomkins up in the tackle and win the turnover. But one of the most impressive things about England's new D is how well they reset after a scramble. Off Freddie Burns' annual knock-on here, Wales play some uncharacteristically lovely rugby to get up to the 22. Adam Beard delivering a beautiful and totally deliberate shut-up Matt Gitto-style bounce pass, and England's D is totally out of sorts for a moment. Don Brandt is forced to jump out of line, it's all a bit loose, but once they shut down the initial danger just through scrambling, everything becomes effortless. As the ball comes out here, Lawrence is big as man, but England don't try anything clever. They just wait for each Welsh player to make a decision until eventually Lawrence is the one who makes the tackle and Owens out. Two players out from his initial opposite man. Wales play a quick phase. England catch them a yard behind the game line. Then as Wales set for the following play, they do the same again. There are no gaps or even weak shoulders until we get right out to Slade here. So Bigger catches the ball having not made a decision on where he's passing yet and England just wait for him to do that. Gradually advancing and eating up his space and his time each second. When he finally makes his choice, these are his options. Crash ball to Jenkins who will be caught five metres behind the game line. Switch to Lewis, he'll be caught five metres behind the game line, or hit half penny and go wide. Because England's system is so built on limiting the space in the middle section of the field, the wing's the only area of any space at all, there's no way for Wales to make it up to the game line without a minimum of four passes. And even then, it's not a guarantee. That's just to reach the game line, not to make a break, just to get up to the game line. It's not so much suffocating, it's just making Wales live in a house without windows, unable to see a way out. Don't get me wrong, there will be sterner tests of that defence than this Wales team, but England were pretty much good for everything they come up against. And that was even including Owen Williams having a quietly excellent game for Cymru, yet finding everything he was able to build shut down pretty quickly. Owen Williams isn't a showy fly half, but he's one of the calmest, most patient tens out there, both perfectly happy to stick the ball long or high if he feels nothing is on and wait and attack another day, or to stretch an attack out for 30 phases if he reckons it will be on soon or this defence is eventually going to break. Wales run a pretty nice smash move here, using the fact that both their centres are bigger and younger than the Millennium Centre to draw England's eye. Hawkins' body language is fantastic. Farrell has no idea which of the three options he's taking until the pass has already come and it allows Grady to ride his weak shoulder all the way over the gain line. Williams then calls a two-phase move where he was previously deployed against South Africa in the last World Cup. One big carry this way, then looking set to do the same on the same side before 10 to 15 swing around last second to draw the prop on the fringe and slip the ball inside to Lee Halfpenny. Except here Sinclair reads it instantly. He points a Halfpenny for Toje to cover and Williams calls the move off himself. He just goes himself not forcing anything, calm as you like. Wales are still in the ascendancy, but this is superb defence. Because they're all about being tight together, England are entirely happy to leave a huge hole here, because Alwyn Jones isn't a realistic threat, so they can set from Hawkins' width outwards and just be tight on each other from there on out. There's no space for Hawkins to do anything, they solidify, meaning Hawkins' options are carry himself or give a hospital ball. And once the ball is free, Lawrence piles over the top and can disrupt it magnificently. From here on out, it's easy pickings for the white wall. Wales go in over four phases, all of them behind the game line, but Williams is He's happy. He doesn't care. He's just patient. He's just being entirely patient and waits for them to work out to an edge so they can reset the attack. And once they do, even though Sinfield's sliding legion has pushed them back 50 metres, he thinks something can still come. He calls a two-phase shape, the idea being he's the outside man in this pod, and Wales reload to attack the blind side. This creates the next phase, with this group of defenders now taken out. But Thomas' line isn't very good, and it forces Fallas out to intercept. But whilst this isn't as smooth as Wales would like, the shape Williams wanted has still been set. The biggest difference between Owen Williams and Dan Bigger as fly halves is, and this is tiny, their body language. If you're in international defence, Dan Bigger is easier to read than a Christmas card written by Elmo. He's always worn his heart on his sleeve, but these days it's like he wears the game plan on it as well, and it's so simple for a defender to tell what he's going to do, he basically telegraphs everything he's doing. Owen Williams, on the other hand, is an enigma. A glance at him preparing a play tells you nothing beyond the fact he likely uses beard oil, and this is no exception. He catches the ball, and with the defence merely inches from his face, his body language has closed off no options. He could feasibly hit any of these three players or carry himself, but as it is, he delivers it to Josh Adams, and Adams' line is brilliant. He starts 
as an inside runner or a clean out option, but then slides out to become the boot runner, a role initially played by Lee Halfpenny, meaning when Pence slides out to become an outside runner, he's almost now invisible to the English defenders. They weren't watching for him. If this is Lewis Rees Amit, right, England are in serious trouble. But as it is, they can adjust and contain Wales as they just get up the 22. Williams calmly walks back into position and, as this goes on, drops off another pass, then tells Hawkins, a 10 at age grade, to organise the next phase whilst he gets the players in shape for the play after that. Hawkins has his options and carries himself. With England scarcely contesting, it means Beard, an excellent own ball breakdown operator, can give Wales a one-man ruck, maximum resources elsewhere on the field, and Williams' incredibly quick ball to play his plan off. And, once again, the Welsh Open Poker Champion 2023 is completely unreadable. Not a glance at any of the players he could be passing to, no look at all, and right here, seconds after catching the ball, and a millisecond before giving it, he could realistically take any of these four options. Alan Wynne Jones's line is superb. He quietly had a brilliant game. Like, people will say he's too old because he took one hospital pass. He was fantastic at the weekend. And this combination holds Willis and allows Adams, once again running a superb line, to straighten brilliantly. Slade commits to him and times it perfectly to put Reese Samet actually in position through the gap. He makes it up to within 10 metres of the line and Wales proceed to run a series of smash-ups. Williams waiting for the next moment to pull the trigger. But before they can get there, Talupe Falatau makes an uncharacteristic error, isolating himself and allowing Lawrence and Don Brandt to get over the ball and turn it over. Chance gone. English defence holds steady, just holds out. The number of turnovers Wales conceded was a huge issue, but there wasn't a systemic problem leading to it as there was in the PVAC era. Just a series of individual mistakes. Falatau picking and going without checking his surroundings here. Alan jones attempting to tie an extra England body into the ruck. Ireland style to take men out without checking if anyone's actually cleared out Ludlam. Or here, Mario Toje gets himself in Thomas and Beard's way. He's not part of the ruck, so he's not entering from the wrong side. There's no penalty against him, but he does make their clear outs totally ineffective because they hit him rather than Willis, allowing the greatest player of all time, have I got my job at BT yet, to win a turnover. I scarcely notice him live, but on repeat watchers, Mario Atoje, I realised, was phenomenal on Saturday. This slapping the ball out of Shunza's hands, another shit out special that gave England the scrum from which they scored that first try. Atoje's game is so built on trying to get away with subtle little cheaty moments that you can almost say the less you notice him when you're watching live, the better he probably was, because this guy is always involved, and when he's subtle, he's unstoppable, which is perhaps not a word I used to describe Wales, you know, there's many I could, but for all the things that are constantly changing, shifting, and looking differently as the Rugby Raw Shark test rolled on, something utterly undeniable about Wales is that they are most certainly, once again, a Warren Gatland team. It's extremely rare that a team coached by the man who, if I were a few years younger or a few years older, I might describe as Waikato's biggest zaddy, but I can't because I'm the tragic sweet spot in age between, oh, they're using it ironically, and oh, they're trying to be embarrassingly down for the kids, which they are most certainly not. Instead, it's just it's just embarrassing. Very rarely takes part in high-scoring games. Wales either won or lost by less than 10 points in 121 of Gatlin's 130 games in charge in his first spell. Almost every game was competitive. And yet, across those 130 games in charge, on only 9 occasions, 9 out of 130, did both teams score 24 points or more. Gatlin sides defend even when they have the ball. They're all about squeaking clear in a match with minimal points on both sides. If you can use every tool at your disposal to keep the opposition to 10, 15 points on the scoreboard, you've only got to score 11, 16 to win it. It doesn't really matter if your attack's not that great. It's a, you score one try, we'll score one try as well, but we'll also kick a penalty from halfway after turning over your fullback from a well-placed bomb. The context, right? On just how unusual Gatland's record of small scoreline games is. Across Wayne Pivak's 31 games in charge as Wales coach, both teams crossed the 24 point barrier on 9 occasions as well. That's the same number in 99 fewer games. Warren Gatlin's sides are all about shutting down the opposition and remaining patient enough to take advantage of the frustration that that may cause. And so we get on to Wales' kicking game. Perhaps frustration's relevant for a lot of people. Because whilst there was a lot wrong with Wales on Saturday and indeed over this full Six Nations, the fact they kicked constantly and in consistent ways and how they kicked was very far from one of them. With the Tiger side influencing the defence, set piece and ultimate die-hard philosophy, Borthwick lent on Quinn's attack coach, Nick Evans, to bring his Battenberg influence to England's attack and perhaps most importantly, their kicking game. I outlined these tactics in more depth the other week, but the essential idea is to trap the opponent in tricky positions where they'll hurry their kick back, allowing England to counter-attack against a disorganised chase. The key is you need to be kicking on the front foot. You need to be the team using your kick to dictate play. So if the opposition kicks it back, they're only responding to how you kick. They're kicking on the back foot. England got into the Welsh 22 on seven occasions on Saturday, and five of them came from this kicking game, either granding territory or chances to face a misaligned defence. This is a perfect example of what England looking to do here, right? It's a free kick off a scrum, and Farrell puts up an utterly phenomenal kick. It's a classic George Ford spiral bomb, meaning it spins in the air, making it tricky to catch, but he aims it beautifully. After the scrum, the Welsh side 
played, fought back and get back 10, including Talibe Faladao. However, figuring they're going to hang a kick, Alan Wynne jones shouts at Faladao to get into the backfield, and so he starts to jog back slowly. Farrell looks up at him briefly, spotting this, and aims for the exact spot where Talupe is headed, where he's going to cover, leading to a nightmare in communications, because Faladao's headed there anyway. Williams is slower to sprint across and cover it, which he would normally do in the situation, but he's now got a teammate headed there, so he's not quite sure. So it's, ah, oh, both leave it. It bounces, Halfpenny recovers it just in time, and just getting his kick away is doing well in these circumstances. But the kick is under such pressure, he's had no time to aim, and it's easy for Farrell to recover and send Stewart on the attack. There's very rarely any space on the first phase of counterattack these days, unless you're doing Van der Merwe, but the second phase is where things really open up. Instead of charging at the smaller man, Halfpenny, and making a more dominant carry, Stewart careers sideways so that he's tackled by both Faletau and Tipperick, where he was two key defenders, smash into the pair of them, taking two men out of the Welsh line for the next phase. The ball is fast, and while England's shape is still setting, it doesn't matter because it's mildly more organised than the Welsh defence. With two back rowers on the floor, the only Welsh forward able to reload to this side is tight head Tom Francis, and Van Porfleet's pass is great, both bringing Watson onto the ball and allowing him to straighten and give a simple ball that takes both Welsh centres entirely out of the game. This turns into a three-on-one, Rizam it forced to step in on Don Brandt, but he can flick it onto Lawrence, and England get themselves up to the 22. The ball gets turned over by Rhys Amit moments later, but it's great proof of what England are trying to do. Use their kicking game to create opportunities to attack. So we get on to Wales's kicking game, because Wales kicked in order to prevent England ever getting the chance to do this, to make sure that England were only ever kicking on the back foot. So how did they do that? That's the big question. Here's an example, right? As Thomas Williams prepares to hang the ball, here the Welsh players set into defensive shape before he kicks it. He does kick it, Stewart regathers it, obviously, but Adams is on him and the full red wall around him instantly. England are on the back foot immediately, but because the Welsh defence was set before England ever had the ball, they can catch Sinclair behind the game line the next phase, and so with no momentum, five forwards off the feet, nothing on defence, completely on top, Farrell has no choice but to kick, but he hurries it because he's under pressure, he puts it out on the full. Wales from the line out, then regather it, they go to crashed up but shuns are over in his line it's less than ideal so they blah, 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 they do all of this and Thomas Williams sets up to kick again and the tactic is the same they're targeting the tram line the convoy set to smash Watts from the moment he takes it in Wales aren't interested in contesting in the air but rather on the ground afterwards Zamit gets a great hit in and Wales would turn this over if not for brilliant intervention by Chesham Wales then catch England behind the game line once again and England now under huge pressure go to clear it again they're kicking on Wales's term just in response to what Wales have done in the situation Wales have put them in it's desperate Slade clear is not Farrell, they're not quite in shape, and he's got just one player chasing. Even in a best case scenario, England are getting nothing out of this kick except the relief of getting out of their own territory, and it allows even a fullback as rotund as 2023 Lee Halfpenny to slalom through a disorganised defence and crash it up to get within a few metres of where England kicked in the first place. One phase later, England give away the penalty in kickable position. Or it's similar here, Wales hang it onto the wing and Stewart gets swamped. Even though he does it well, the Welsh defence is set and catch George behind the game line. Farrell has to kick in hurry, nothing Nothing set up to chase, nothing really set around him, Single has to dive at the floor to get out of the way, and Faletau gets right in the way, charging it down and leaving England scrambling in their own 22. And even when England did get on top in kicking battles, Wales just refused to concede, they refused to let them have their win. Owen Williams here attempts a 50-22 from an across the face sweeper kick, but gets half charged down and it gives Stewart the chance to initiate one of England's Quinn style kicking duels to open up space and create those kind of opportunities. England start to really get on top here, they're dropping the ball all over the Welsh 22, red shirts are focused solely on just recovering it and sending it back, just pelleting it back. It's looking like it's set to be a slaughter, giving England, even in a kind of worst case scenario for them, a 40 metre net gain. And then Farrell almost nails a master stroke. A faster bounce on this, and it's a 50-22 of his own. England have eaten up 50 metres and regained the ball. Except, this reply by Owen Williams after regathering it is superb. He makes it bounce twice before he gets to Farrell and reduces the time he has on the ball, meaning he has to change tactic because the defence is now up far closer than he'd like. This is a great great plan B, however it's a really good kick, and whilst Wales recover it, after Stewart's shot there's at best an eighth of a penny left, and Wales play a couple of phases to get the chase back and ready. And because they've been playing it long so consistently, suddenly playing it short means Stewart is miles away and Rhys Amick can get under it, the fullback not anticipating this shallower nudge. This changes the momentum of the battle entirely. Wales go wide off this, because they've got clean ball to play off with a disorganised defence, seeing so much space here, Slade panics slightly and steps out of line, allowing Mason Grady to step outside him and get the ball to Adams. His option and 
and choice of kick is superb, but under time pressure, it's a yard too long because if this sits up and forces Stewart to play it in the 22, Wales would have successfully turned a kicking battle in which they were being slaughtered, which England were all over them into a stellar victory through sheer bloody mindedness, through absolute commitment to never giving England a satisfaction and just kicking constantly. One of the biggest topics of shrieking, high pitch shrieking, I have no idea who I'm talking about, after Saturday's game was Wales' repeated decision to kick to big old lump of world class stuff, Freddie Stewart, but whilst the tactic played into his hands, that was more to do with Stewart's outstanding style than Wales. I've seen Stewart play in person a few times in the last year, and something that's always stood out is how, whenever the opposition set up to kick, he would call on his winger and swap places, putting himself on the wing to cover the kick and having them slot into fullback. There aren't any camera angles that show it on any game I can find, but it's something you can spot in the stadium, something to keep an eye out if you go and watch Stewart play for England or Leicester, keep an eye out for it, because he puts himself in positions that make it impossible for Wales not to target him. In the second half, Wales did introduce a few Springbok style crossfield bombs in order to target the other wing, knowing he'd fill in on this one, but ultimately their tactic was to catch England on the back foot rather than to regather the ball, rather than to compete in the air. They're not interested in contesting here, so it didn't matter all too much who was taking it in. And indeed, this tactic did lead to Wales's one try. Here, Williams box kicks and Stewart takes it in on that tram line, but Wales put huge pressure on him and a whole host of forwards are needed to swamp in to clear this out before Wales catch England behind the gain line the next phase. Adam Beard does a brilliant job at the breakdown and six of England's eight forwards are now out of the game, having been forced to commit to these two phases. Entirely because Wales' defence was set faster thanks to their kicking game, meaning the shape here is lacking deception. If you compare it to when England ran a near identical pattern a bit later in the game, here, they're playing a fresher, cleaner ball, so have Chesham in position right here, rather than at the bottom of the rock on the other side of the pitch. And it means Wales have to waver a second longer, watching an extra runner, and therefore it means when Lewis Rees Samick goes for the interception, he's too late. This time, however, slightly earlier, with the shape lighter thanks to the pressure the kicking game has created, Rees Samick can make the read so much earlier and step in to take the interception, and he's really fast, Lewis Rees I don't know if you've noticed this, and he puts Wales ahead. It's also very telling that all five of the chances England had to use their kicking game to get into it came off the same two situations. Free kicks and dropouts, including this one, which leads the eventual winning try for Ollie Lawrence. Bigger bangs the dropout long? And same as the earlier example, Farrell hangs incredibly high, aiming for a bit of space Wales have left empty, knowing Halfpenny is completely ridiculous at covering the backfield, so we'll be able to cover it, except he's having to cover quite a bit of distance already, and the spiral bomb changes trajectory at the last second, and Halfpenny drops it. A dog falls out of hell as Van Portfleet is rapid and regathers it, recovers the ball, spreads it wide. And from pretty much this moment on, England use countless phases and beats such as this by Slade to keep Wales in their own territory to keep them under enormous, incredible pressure. But also, in between these attacks, England changed the scrum half. Van Porfley and Alex Mitchell are very different kinds of nine. For my money, Rafi Quirk's a better player and Ben Young still has something to offer England, but Alex Mitchell is so different from Van Porfley, it changes what happens here completely. Where JVP is a brilliant game management and all-rounder, Mitchell is bloody rapid and regularly causes chaos for Northampton with this kind of sideways run he loves to do, just waiting for players to jump out of line and present opportunity. It worked last week against Italy as well. The Welsh defence is holding up all right for the first 10 phases, knowing what they're dealing with. You know, it's the same as it has been all game. But all of a sudden, the prospect changes very suddenly. There's something different in the attack that they haven't faced all game. England have lost all shape here. Their attack is solely comprised of two individual runners. There's nothing organised on the other side as well. But Mitchell's pick and go is a totally new idea for Wales and allows him to get on the outside of Jenkins and times it for the second. Nick Tompkins, who I don't have time to get into it, but was dog shit off the bench. He just managed to screw up and ruin the Welsh shape in both attack and defence. It was really quite impressive how poor he was and how much he managed to break in a system that was already not doing, you know, extraordinarily well. Turns his head to face him. It allows Slade to steam past him. Halfpenny makes a typically heroic tackle, but this time Mitchell just goes for the simple ball off the base. It's a beautifully spun pass and England have reloaded fast enough. Stewart hands are also quick and Lawrence finishes in style to take the win. This easily could have been an utterly comprehensive win for England. Farrell had one of those games, and if he hadn't, uh, 10 points can be added on. And their conversion rate when they got into the 22, whenever they overcame the tactics Wales were using to repress them, was exceptional. It still feels early in their building process, but they're certainly starting to put one far more traditionally English brick on top of another and build something together. Something's definitely starting to work with Steve Borthwick's England. Wales, on the other hand, this was a game they let slide. Warren Gatland teams are built on patience but it's so hard to be patient if you don't believe. If you
but Wales of 2018-19 into that exact game at 65 minutes, they would have gone on to win. I have absolutely no questions about that. And not because they were better players or they were younger and more full of energy or anything like that, but because they got into the habit of winning. They built the belief deep down that these tactics work, that if they remain patient at key moments, things would start to work for them. Wales of that era forced nothing. They waited until chances presented themselves and took them. Wales on Saturday played the right tactics to hold England to a points tally that they could overtake. They played the tactics that Gatlin had them playing in 2018-19 that got them so far and they could have worked again this weekend. They very almost did. But look what happened each time Wales found themselves in a position to take those points, to take those chances, because they did come. Thomas Williams takes a quick tap on a penalty between the posts. Three points denied. So Lupe Faletel picks and goes without checking what support he has around him. Kieran Hardy throws a wide ball that isn't right and Reese Carey for some reason ignores it rather than even trying to catch it right as where well as are starting to get on top in attack. Nick Tompkins comes on and does whatever the hell this is in his own 22 instead of simply calming down and exiting and waiting for a more obvious attacking chance to present itself. Owen Williams, and this is maybe one of the biggest turning points of the game, rolls to try and steal more ground on the floor and gets penalised for it, gifting England territory for Kyle Sinclair's try to put them back ahead. Wales got in position to score four tries, and they easily could have, but they took none of them. Things for Wales feel bad, and in many areas, particularly their conversion rate in the 22, they really are. But so much of this has always been a part of being a Warren Gatlin team. The problem on Saturday was that Wales, after three years of batshit weirdness and two rounds of abject misery, didn't remember how to win a game like that, and their patience at key moments slipped. It's only going to take Wales winning one game for them to build the belief and momentum that can start to lead to a second game being won and then a third and start to really turn things around potentially in time for the World Cup but you do wonder where those wins are going to come especially with Italy looking as good as they are. The first two rounds Wales were abject rubbish but against England most of the Warren Ball pieces fell into place they just didn't have the patience to put them over the top. They're now hoping they're able to turn next week's game into a horrible to watch hideously almost like broken game because those are the circumstances under which they be able to win it and maybe it will spark things and they can get going once again because after all it has been quite the week that was a half hour video on a game that most people seemingly didn't enjoy so i hope you enjoyed it thank you for watching it i truly do appreciate it um scott and france will be next i'm working on that at the minute that should be next week these videos are going longer and longer and more and more detailed more and more kind of out of control uh, much more work than they were, you know, a few years ago when I was doing five, ten minutes on a game. Um, it's getting ridiculous now. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. I want to congratulate Sersha, who's top of the Squid Rugby Fantasy League at the minute. Amazing stuff. I'm 2000 and something place, so it's not going ideally. Um, I am very stupid, as you're learning from that. But I am also trying to work through the stuff. So thank you very much and we'll see you soon for more rugby. Outside of rugby, I'm probably most passionate about golf and PlayStation. Uh...